Welcome. The following video or audio are the study of the Bible, chapter by chapter, verse by verse of the King James 1611 Bible. Our family welcomes you to our household Bible ministry time. You may watch and listen with us. Our goal has been from Genesis to the book of Revelation. Each chapter by chapter we try. And topical preaching and teaching aids you can find by searching different topics. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly divine the word of truth. Come and appreciate the word of God for our spiritual growth, our development in the word of God by these lessons. Please feel, feel, please feel welcome to upload and share our Bible study with family and friends. Like us, subscribe, write a comment, let us know you heard the message. The video or audio are not copyrighted and should be used and not abused. Thank you. Second Peter. Now, first Peter, we dealt with the attacks from the outside from the Christian, from the world, the government, people, friends. Second Peter, we're going to deal with attacks from the inside the church, what the church and what the Christians will do to a Christian. In chapter one. <clears throat> We're going to deal with, start right off with the individual Christian himself. Where does he stand? What is he doing? How is he doing? So in chapter 1 of 2 Peter, we see Simon Peter, a servant. We're all to be servants. We're all called for service for Jesus Christ. An apostle. An apostle we talked about many times. Apostle is a person. Peter saw and witnessed the ministry of John the Baptist and was baptized by John. He wouldn't be an apostle. We know he he walked and lived and his being was with Jesus Christ for three and a half years. Peter gives us that spice of the gospel. And we definitely know that he saw the resurrected Christ because we saw Christ on the beast said, Peter, do you love me? Said, Lord, you know I love you. Feed my lambs. So, we do know the qualification for the apostles is sure and sound. As we know with Paul, the office is an apostle. And then you can't be an apostle today. It's absolutely impossible. You cannot be baptized at John's baptism. You cannot see the resurrected Christ because the rapture has not happened. And you could not walk in the footsteps of Jesus during his ministry. To them that have obtained like precious faith, salvation, through faith in the, in the gospel of Jesus Christ that died for our sins, according to scripture, was buried and arose again the third day, according to the scriptures. These people are just as saved as I am saved, I'm saved just as much as they are saved. <clears throat> the precious, it's precious salvation with us. Peter included, and those with Peter, through the righteousness of God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. So salvation is wrought by righteousness, not of my own, but that of God. Else in the Bible it says the righteousness of Jesus Christ. So again, God and Jesus are the same. This and does not separate God. As, you know, here's God and here's Jesus. Like it like they say in Titus 2.13. Well, you see, there's God and then there's Jesus. No, it's God and including Jesus Christ. Grace and peace be multiplied. So, in a Christian life, grace and peace, it's not something that just levels out. It is something that can be obtained more and more unto you, Christians, through the knowledge of God and our and of Jesus our Lord. So the more you know about God, the more you know about Jesus Christ, the more grace and the more peace you get. So that means you got to be active. You got to be a verb. You got to be doing. You got to be studying. <coughs> you got to be loving God. You got to be growing. 
You know, when a child is born and he's on the sincere milk of the word, there are things he does not get that a mature child will get. And as more we mature in God and knowledge, the more we get. It's a blessing to grow as a Christian. According as his divine power, God's divine power, has given unto us all things that pertain unto life, our eternal life, all has been given us, a mansion, New Jerusalem, streets of gold, crowns, rewards, no pain, no sin, all that that is to come. It's come by Jesus Christ and by God. And then life today, our food, our raiment, our being comes from God. God is our creator. Everything that exists and has exist exists by God and God alone. And God is through the knowledge, again, knowledge of him that has called us to glory and virtue, which is moral excellence. We are to know God more and more and more in the Lord Jesus Christ. And with that knowledge we get from Him by living, by growing, it benefits us. As the Christian goes from a newborn babe to, as Paul said, Paul the age. I know a lot more things than I knew when I was saved 30 years ago. I know more things than last year. With growth as a Christian, you should bring experience. There are things I've done, I learned, no, you don't do that. There are things that I learned, hey, that, that's approved, I do that. <clears throat> Whereby are given unto us exceedingly great and precious promises. There are promises to Christians, but let's mark the promises to Christians and not the promises to the Jews. Let's separate the promises to who it belongs to. Let's not steal from something that's not ours. Then we'd be charged with, thou shall not steal. You can do that with the Bible. You can proclaim that something is yours and it's not. That rightly divide, the Bible said. That by these ye might be partakers of the divine nature having escaped the corruption that is in the world through love, lust, my salvation, my being born again, has brought me out of the world, has brought me out of Egypt. I am away from that. Lo, I'm a sinner today, but I'm still a sinner. That sinner, that sinness of the world and of Satan, of the old nature, is not going to bring me condemnation, it's not going to bring me damnation, and it's not going to bring me to hell. I'll lose rewards. I'll end up with ashes. But I'm not no more the world. I am not no more a child of Satan. I'm a child of God. I've been given eternal life. I've been given grace and peace by knowing Jesus Christ. I have been given life and godliness by knowing Jesus Christ. I have been given virtue by the gospel of Jesus Christ. I have obtained much. By the way of Jesus Christ through Calvary, through the empty tomb. And think, 30 years ago I got saved probably because I didn't want to go to hell. And look how much I've learned. It's not just not going to hell. It's all the love and benefits that God has put upon us. That he loves us. It's not just God loved us to save our soul. It's miraculous and wonderful and great the promises God has given to those who believe on Jesus Christ. It's a wonderful thing. And you learn more and more every year. Wherever you stand as a Christian, wherever your growth spurt is right now, continue to grow, continue to go, continue to know more about God. The greater it gets, the long-lasting it gets. Don't go back to Thessalonica like the demons did. Because once that moment you turn and go back, you become a spiritual retard. You have stopped your growth. 
And that spiritual retardedness is not because of a birth defect. It's because you have chosen to turn away from God. There's too many spiritual retards out there by their own will, by their own doing, by laziness. <clears throat> so, and besides this, besides what God has given us, all the mercy and greatness, besides this, giving all diligence. Now, diligence <clears throat> is a tax work. Diligence is you make sure that that number that you're going to put in that box, in that row, is the exact number. It's in the exact position that it belongs in. And then when you finish, you go over it again, and you go over a second and a third time. You make sure that that report to the IRS is correct. Because the IRS will take a chunk out of your butt if you're wrong. And you don't want to do that. You want to submit those taxes, and you want those taxes to be correct. To the best of your ability, due diligence, not sloppiness. <clears throat> so Peter is saying, listen, give it all your all, give it the best, check it out. So when we read this list, it's like, okay, check off, check off, check off, I did it, check off. No, you keep doing it. You keep certifying that you've done it correctly. You keep applying it to your life. It's something that does not go until you die or rapture. Keep checking. Make sure you stand. <clears throat> Besides this, given all diligence, add to your faith. Faith is the foundation. I believe Jesus died for my sins. He arose from the grave. He's virgin born. That's what started my walk as a Christian. That is what started my birth to being a, a born again Christian. Faith. All right. So where do we go from there? <clears throat> There's room for growing. By the sincere work, milk of the word. Paul says later on to the Corinthians that, you know, meat. Virtue. Virtue is strength. You get strength by food, by drink. A person that is eight years old, that's a teenager, that's an adult, cannot survive and be strengthened by milk. They need vegetables, they need protein, they need vitamins, they need, and that comes from the Word of God. Study to show thyself a food unto God, a workman that needs not to be shamed, rightly dividing the Word of Truth. You've got to go from milk to food, to steak, pork, I like pork. you got to grow. you got to make sure that your body, as far as the Word of God is, as a Christian, is not lacking vitamins and minerals. Well, you may need that stuff in your in your physical body. You may be able to lack some of that, but as far as your Christian walk, you ought not be lacking. You ought to have fullness of strength, and strength comes by reading. Strength comes by praying. Strength comes by doing the Word of God. Be ye doers of the Word and not hearers only. You got to exercise your ears, your eyes, your nose, your mouth. And your, your feet and your hands. You got to put all the senses for strength for being a Christian. <clears throat> and to virtue, knowledge again, three times knowledge. We're never going to know God to the fullest. We're never going to master this Bible. Friend, if, you, if you're set out to read the Bible this, this year, Glory to God, do it. And then the next year, pick it up and read it again, and you're going to see, well, I didn't see that. Where was that? <clears throat> I've been saved for 30 years. I've read my Bible through many years. I'm still seeing new things. I'm still learning. I'm still getting more of a knowledge of God than I had last year and the years before. It don't stop until you stop. The moment you tell God, I quit, that's it. It's done. But if you say, God, I'm thirsty and I'm hungry, man, he puts it out. It's like sitting at a counter at a, at a cafe. You're sitting there, I, I want some more. He puts it down. I have something to drink. He gives you a drink. You finish that plate. I want more, God. And he'll give you more. But the moment you get off that stool and start walking out, then that's it. It stops. 
knowledge. And to knowledge, temperance. It's <clears throat> temperature. That's your temper. That's your attitude. That's your anger. We got to work on that. Many years I had a temper, and with the street ministry, there's there are times that people will come up, and you know, I can't show them anger. I can show them sarcasm. And some people say that pressures the point. But if somebody's going to blow up at me because I'm preaching the gospel, I can't blow up at them. I can't blow up when I look at Christians all around me and you're, you're nuts, you're stupid, you're, you're not doing what the Bible said. Aren't you paying attention to what's going on around you? I can't blow up at that. I can't get upset. They've got to grow. They, i got to pray for them. They gotta pray for me when I do that. They can't get upset with me to blow me out. We gotta be temporal. Temperance. And to temperance, patience. Again, the Christian walk is patient. God is very patient. God is never, ever in a hurry. I pray to God that God, please, I, you know, hurry, hurry, hurry. God, he takes his time. He has his time frame, and he's going to do it by his time frame. We cannot look at loved ones and people we know as friends and, come on, get saved. It's not now. It's not the time. We can't say, God, come on, answer this prayer now. We're going to have to wait. We've been many years with the street ministry. We have not seen anybody get saved by that. But I've seen men in prison get saved. I've seen men in prison turn around from the wrong Bible to the right Bible. One of these days, maybe somebody will come across that street and say, Hey, I want to get saved. Hey, I want to do right. Got to wait for it. We can't push someone. You know, you can't sit down another sin there is. Uh, you're witnessing to them, right? And you kind of have got them. And it's not going to go where they're going to receive Christ as their Savior. And then you say, in lack of faith, well, just say this prayer with me and you'll be saved. No, that's damnation. Say this prayer is a lack of patience. And it's condemnation to the person that's going to say that prayer. you got to work salvation to its full, by its step, by its step, by its step. To make sure that person is going to trust Christ, they're doing it. Trusting in Christ and not the big mouth. With the heart, man believes unto righteousness. Then the mouth confesses. Too many people make the mouth confess without the heart. That's their nation. And to patience, godliness. God, being like God. You can be like God. How do I become like God? You gotta have the faith. You gotta work with the strength. You've got to get the knowledge. You've got to control the, the anger, the, the temperance. You've got to have patience. And then that brings God to this. That brings perfection in your life. That will bring you to, hey, this is what the Bible says. This is what the Bible doesn't say. And to God in this brotherly kindness. We've got to be kind to the brethren. We've got to be patient with them. We've got to have strength. We've got to have knowledge before we deal with them. We've got to be godly ourselves. We can't approach the Christians, you know, with our own motes in our eyes. We've got to be helpful. We've got to be loving the brethren. we got to be a resource of whatever their needs that we be the dispensers, dispensary for others in our church and missionaries and throughout the body of Christ. We've got to be respectable, honorable. And to brotherly kindness, charity. <clears throat> charity is love in action. It is a love that is a verb and it's never selfish. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. What does that get God? It got me. Big deal. And yet look what God gave me by that love through Jesus Christ. Eternal life. A 
body is never going to sin again and no more sin and no more pain no more sorrow he stepped down from glory from his throne and came and suffered beyond suffering beyond brutality to suffer and die for me when we say we love God that's true because many of us don't charity God and in order to have charity and love, we've got to have God, because the Bible says God is love. Friend, you don't know God. You've never trusted in Jesus Christ. You had never put your faith and trust in Jesus and the, the finished atonement of the, of the gospel. You don't know what love is, because you don't know God. If you are of your father, the devil, and your father is not God, there is no love in your life. You think you got love, but you don't know what love is. Satan has no love. Satan has no care. He has no mercy. He has no grace. He has no peace. What we're reading about God here that gives to the Christian, Satan never has. He can never offer it. He can never give it. For if these things be in you, not an outward appearance, not something you just put on, okay, I'll put this on because I'm no. It's got to be in you. It's got to be in your heart, not your head. In your heart. And abound. That means to have, to possess. You own it. You got it. They make you that ye shall neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Fruit bearing relies on nine things that we just read there are nine things that you need to, to bear fruit for God and about God and all these must be in our lives they must be practiced in our life they must be done in our lives in order to know more about God say well I don't know about Jesus I'm lacking I don't go back to this list of nine diligently look at this list and see where you're lacking you, you know, you can skip out on one. You need all nine. And notice the nine fruits of the Spirit also work together with these to produce fruits. But he that lacks these things is blind. You don't see. You can't see. Jesus throughout his ministry kept saying they have eyes but they see not. They were lacking. You guys, they did not know who Jesus Christ was, but they knew who Jesus was and still crucified him and never realized that they fulfilled the Old Testament scriptures and prophecies about their Messiah and still had no idea what they did, but had an idea. For envy, envy is not in this list. Pilate says that they delivered him over to the Roman government, Jesus. Envy is not in this list. Matter of fact, instead of envy, they should have been more temperate. They should have been no, more knowing about God. They should know who Jesus Christ said, Hey, listen, Jesus. We know you're the Messiah. We know that there has to be some kind of suffering. We don't understand. What can we do to fulfill the scriptures for your life? Without sinning. And that never happened. They were blind. They were blind leading the blind, Jesus said. Why? And this is a man that lived three and a half years with Jesus telling us this. Why were they blind? They lacked these nine things. And cannot see afar off. There are people out there who do not know where they're going to go into eternity. Oh, they think. But they don't have an assurance. They might know. But... There are plenty of people that have a piece of paper that says they got knowledge from a college, but that doesn't approve of God. Then don't do nothing for God. There are people that have a retirement plan, great retirement plan. But as far as death and the afterlife and to know God, blank, dead. And has forgotten that he was purged from his old sins. So here's a Christian. 
And there's a church like this in Revelation that they forgot their first love. And it's possible, Christian, that you are saved and you become of no use to God. You become dead. You become weary. You become useless. Because you forgot what Christ has done for you. You have forgotten where, where you came from. What we call going back to Bethel. You need to get back to the day where you were saved. Bring yourself back to Calvary. That moment that Christ saved and you believed on the saving power of Christ. You need to get back to that happy greatest moment in your life. Where you were born again. And not leave Calvary until you get that love back. And certify that by going to the empty tomb as, hey, it's a seal sign. Oh, wait a minute. The seal's been broken because Christ is risen from the grave. We need to go back to Calvary. We need to remember. And we're going to look at that in a moment here. But we'll wait till we get there. I'm so excited. I'm jumping ahead of myself. So we can forget that moment we were saved. We can forget that moment. That what Christ has done by coming in our life, by washing away our sins. Wherefore, the rather, wherefore the rather, brethren, save people, give diligence, there's that word again, to make your calling and election sure. For if ye do these things, ye shall never fall. Now, brethren, they're saved. I'm going to say for the, for, <coughs> for the unsaved, which is, not context, but you're not saved, get saved. Okay? But being saved, you can't lose it. And what Peter is saying here, listen. You become cold, old, <laughs> dead, lazy, sleeping. Wake up. Get back to your first love. Revive that spirit back in the Lord. Bring it back. Due diligence to go back to where you and God met. And get it right. And then you won't fall. Keep it alive. Feed it. Don't let it die down. Don't let it die out. Don't blow it out. Don't quench the spirit. Keep it alive. Keep it well. Keep it going. And you'll never fall. But I fell. You lost that love. You became dead. You tired out. For so an entrance that's going into shall be ministered unto you abundantly unto the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Psalms 119, 130, thy word is an entrance. It's the word. The first thing you start doing to get tired and start getting weary is you put the word down. You won't read no more. I try not ever to put the Bible down for three days. I try not ever put it down, but you know, if you're sick, you don't feel well, I, you know, I try to give no more than three days without the word. Prayer is another thing that we give up. We start getting weary. So the first thing you start showing, you know, when you get tired, you get back in the word. Pick it up, read it, read it all the way through, study it, devour it, eat it. This is our milk. This is our honey. This is our meat. Wherefore, I will not be neglect. Uh, I will not be <clears throat> neglect to put you always in remembrance of these things, though ye know them, and be established in the present truth. Okay, I know them, but I'm going to put you in remembrance. That sounds kind of weird, Paul, Peter. There are things we know and we forget. I forget Jesus often. That's why I sin. I don't keep Jesus on a constant thing in my heart. The Lord's Supper is to be the same thing. The Lord's Supper, when we do that, it's not just to, you know, okay, let's have some bread and let's have some little uh, grape juice. It's to remind us of what the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. 
It's to remind us that Christ is coming. We need that memory because we lapse. This world distracts us from the Bible. It distracts us from God and Jesus Christ. And we need to be reminded about it. We're doing this lesson right now. If you were to torture me tomorrow and say, give me this list that you did in First Peter, you may have to go ahead and torture me. I may not remember. I know. I've studied. I've read it. How many times have I read the Bible? How many times? I now, this is the second time I'm doing this video. The first time we didn't unplug the cord. So this is two times I'm doing this video. I've read this list and studied this list. Tomorrow I'll forget. I forget people's names. Terrible. But we know it's there. Ask yourself. Today's Tuesday. When was the last time you actually really went to Calvary and thought about the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ? Come on, be honest with yourself. When was the last time you actually thought about Jesus sitting down with people and teaching them the Word of God? When was the last time you actually took the Bible and just said, you know, I'm not going to just read it to read it. I'm going to dine on it. When was the last time you thought about Jonah? When was the last time you thought about Noah, Moses, Peter, James, John? When was the last time you... See, we know it's in there. But we forget, don't we, in our daily lives. And we got to be reminded. That's what church service does. Listen, this is what these videos do is remind you. I put my Facebook all about... Remind you about praising God. Remind you about history. Remind you to serve God. <coughs> remind you. Because we forget. Remind me. Because we forget. We forget. Yea, I think it me. As long as I am in this tabernacle, the body. This is this is the body of Peter. This is my tabernacle. And it's funny when you deal with the Old Testament Jew as we were the other day. Where is their tabernacle? It's gone. Yet this tabernacle of God that I have, no one brings a, a, a goat, an oxen, turtle dove. They don't bring it here. But in me is the Holy of Holies. Because in my heart, there is the Holy Spirit and Jesus Christ abiding in me. I'm a child of God. I am of the priest. By faith in Jesus Christ. This is the temple. This is the tabernacle. That prayer is offered up, and not the blue, the blood of bulls and goats, but the blood of Jesus Christ has washed me and made me clean. And with this tabernacle, I can witness to a lost person the blood of Jesus, and they can be made clean. This is called a vessel. It's to be clean for God. Tabernacle. To stir you up by putting you in remembrance. So Christians for other Christians are to remind Christians about serving God and doing right. And we do that by talking the Bible. Talking about Jesus. Now, listen, it makes me uh, offended that you go to church and the only thing people can talk about is sports. Movies. And worldly junk. Or crap. It's not the place to talk about that junk. If you're amongst the body of Christians, it ought to be something to talk about that's Christian and not crap. Remind each other. Say, hey, the Lord answered his prayers this week. The Lord's able to answer prayers. I've got prayers. Lord, I've got this blessing, this testimony that the Lord's done for me. <clears throat> the Lord is still working our lives. Remind others by what he's done in your life. Listen to what he has done in other people's lives. Remind yourself that God works and is still working and is still great in mercy. You ain't going to get down how many hit balls the guy hit or how much the movie was or what was the plot. You ain't going to get it out of that junk. That's junk. Knowing that shortly I must put off this, my tabernacle, 
even as our Lord Jesus Christ had showed me. That's John 21, 18, 19. Jesus told Peter he's going to die. He's going to die in the hands of man, and he's not even going to be able to control it. They'll carry him. And they said he was crucified. And he's still serving. From John chapter 21 to uh, 2 Peter, he's still serving. Size of fact is he's going to die in the, man, in the hands of man. He's not going to close his eyes one night and go to sleep and wake up in glory. He's going to die by torture. He still serves the Lord. He wasn't told when he was going to die, but he's still serving the Lord. So that should not give us an excuse to quit on the Lord. Hey, in America, where I am right now, I got more chances of going to sleep and going home to be with the Lord than somebody nailing me to a cross right now. Moreover, I will endeavor that ye may be able after my decease to have these things always in remembrance. Again, remember, 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 remind yourself. Reading this Bible every day reminds you. I'm going to the book of, well actually I just finished, I'm going to uh, Nehemiah. I just got finished reading the Chronicles. What's that remind me of? What's that tell me? We're sinners. <coughs> we have a good one. We have a good king in our life. And we got bad king. We got more bad kings than we got good kings in our life. It reminds me the government is, is filthy. All the filthy governments that, that Israel and Judah have. And yet, we may get one good one. Reminds me of all sinners. There's a story there that man who, who chopped up his, his wife into 12 different parts and all that, that, that. He said, what's that filthy story about? Man and his sins. What's the story of Noah tell me? What's that remind me? The love of God. Though only eight people were saved, Noah preached those people and they rejected God. That tells me out in the streets when I'm preaching, they're not all going to come in. Our entire world population, only eight got in that boat. The Bible is to remind us. That's what you're daily reading. It's not a chore. It's a lesson. And if you had a mystery or a, or a romance novel, you, you take that in. You devour that. And what knowledge does that get for you in the end? Absolutely hogwash. Stupid, nothing. Some make a, you know, you gotta get the next book, then you gotta get the next book, then you gotta get the next book, then you gotta get the next book. Then the person dies themselves, and you never find out what happened. How about the, how about the one that wrote this book that lives forever, who will never die? For we have not followed cunning, devised, yeah, cunning devised fables. We don't use pirates and food talking to us about God and Jesus. We don't tell about stories of little girls and little boys. We don't use that junk. We use, I use the Bible. I use Jonah, Noah, Moses, Peter, Jesus, John. And these are not stories. These are actual truths of people in their lives by God and against God. Now you may have a great wonderful testimony about your patch and stuff like that. But that is not to be taught to kids in a Sunday school when it's supposed to be about the Bible. And we don't need to be teaching our people lies to get a laugh. We need to be speaking the truth to Christians because Christians will remember more a stupid joke than the message. Let me ask you a question. Today is Tuesday, May 2nd. Let me ask you a question. Ready? Here we go. 
What was Sunday's message about in your church? Do you remember? Or was there a joke that you remember? Was there a laugh that you remember more than what the message was about? Do you know the details of, of people in the Bible in their lives? Do you know who gave uh, uh, Elijah anxiety? What moment was that anxiety after? Do you know the Bible stories? Do your children know the Bible story or do they know other stories? Do they know more about Jack and the Beanstalk than David and Goliath? Do you know what the Roman and Greek mythologies did? They took, let's say, let's, okay, let, let's see for a minute. Let, let's tell a fairy tale. All right. Oh, I just said that. I forgot the guy's name. Oh, boy. Hercules. You heard about Hercules, haven't you? You have, you've heard about Brutus and Popeye, haven't you? You know, strong to the finish, I eat my spinach. What about these muscular men? What about Mr. Atlas? What about them? You know, those are fables from one man in the Bible, Samson. Samson was a strong man. Samson had strength. He had strength in God, not spinach. Not as Hercules. You see, the Greek and Roman mythology took men from the Bible and gave it their own names. They did that with Mary. Mary is Astrid. Mary is, is all other female goddesses' names just brought into one. So when you get up and preach you know, against Roman Catholicism with Mary worship and all that, you're doing the same thing when you bring these books and these stories to your children, even your congregation. Instead of bringing the stories of the Bible. <clears throat> Jonah is a wide story in the Bible that is not believed even amongst Christians. We need to bring the Bible stories back to children's lives. And when you buy that child, that, that book, that cute little book, you know, for little fingers and all that. You need to read that thing and find out, does it match the Bible? Children's Bible. Oh, we're against the NIV, we're against the ASV. But then you give your child one of those little Bible things and it's completely not what the Bible says. What's the difference, my friend? A lie is a lie and the church today has covered up lies. Pink and polka dot and white lies and black lies and lies for comedy and lies, blah, 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 blah. Devised fables. When we made known unto you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. So instead of lies, instead of tales, we taught Jesus. Peter, three and a half years with Jesus Christ, and he spoke about Jesus. He may have told people what we have not read, because John's already said, listen, all the books, you couldn't contain all the books that what Jesus done. Peter would sit down with the people and say, this is what Jesus done. P Peter would sit down and say, I, I, I know it's bad, it's a miserable time in my life, but let me tell you about what happened when I denied Jesus Christ. Let me tell you what happened that morning. Because I don't want you to deny him. Let me tell you, we're going to learn about the mountain transfiguration. Let me tell you about that glorious moment. Let me tell you about the time that I stepped out of that boat and walked on the water. Let me tell you about Jesus when he went off to go pray by himself. Let me tell you about Noah. Let me tell you about Moses. Listen. We've got away with all these stories in, uh, in schools today and not the Bible. We have gone to the fact is that people don't even know they're male and female today. We could have got that if we brought Adam and Eve into the school and taught them Adam and Eve. But we took out the Bible. We took out those stories. So we believe, I don't even know what it is called when you're not a male or female. 
God in his Bible had told you that there's a male and female and that's it. But you took the Bible out. You gave him a cute little story. For he received from God, Jesus received from God, the Father, honor and glory. If you don't receive Christ with honor and glory, you're going to be charged with guilt. And you're going to be in rebellion against God because as far as Jesus Christ, God gave him honor and glory. When there came such a voice to him, Jesus, from the excellent glory, heaven. How does Peter describe heaven? Excellent glory. How does Jesus describe, I mean, how did Peter describe God? Excellent glory. This is my beloved son, in whom I am well pleased. That's what God said at the baptism of Jesus. This is what God said at the mountain transfiguration. It's been recorded by everyone that was there that afternoon when Jesus was baptized. Recorded in the gospel. It's been recorded by three men that were there when, on the mountain transfiguration. Out of the mouth of two or three witnesses, it shall be established. People are going to be damned to hell with it, with the acknowledgement that God spoke to his son saying, This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. God approved of Jesus Christ. And this voice which came from heaven we heard, Peter, James, and John, when we were with him in the Holy Mount. Ooh, that's interesting. Holy Mount. The Holy Mount. We have also a more sure word of prophecy. Listen, when Peter was there, God spoke. Now with the writing of the Bible. In black and white and red if you got the words of Christ in red this is more sure than that voice that Peter heard Peter James and John could, could have not heard it all possible I'm not saying they did but they could have but we have God's Word in writing beyond a shadow of a doubt except for when men have corrected it the modern Bible. I believe the King James Bible is of God, the Holy Spirit. Okay? Now, when it comes to what God said to Peter, James, and John on that mount, okay, great. I believe it. But I wasn't there. That's faith. But when I can take the Bible and say, He that believes on the Son has everlasting life, and he that believes not on the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abides upon him. I can open up into this Bible and show you where it says it. I can tell you about Jesus Christ and open up to the page and show and have your eyeballs read it. I can take this Bible to a court and stand before a judge and read this word and that word that I hold and read before the court will prove evidence to be so. I have in my hands the book that records God creating the heaven and earth. You know what? Where is the written proof of evolution? Where is it? There is no written proof of evolution. And yet God himself through the Holy Spirit wrote it down. Oh, Moses. Yeah, Moses. Yes. Man is the pen while the Holy Spirit is the ink. We're going to read that. 
This is the very word of God that God has given us. The instructions of what he demands from us. And yet the free will he also tells us. How to please him and how not to please him. And the conduct of, of men and women in their lives and our enemy. And about Jesus Christ and the future. God put it in writing. You know what that makes God? That makes him hold accountable to everything he wrote. And if God does not fulfill what he wrote, then he's no God. And to certify the 100%ness of God, he wrote it. That's how sure God is, and that's how sure I am to be with God. He put it in writing. There are people today, you make, you you know, you see these, these uh, uh, television court programs. Oh, we didn't have it in writing. Well, then, you know, you're out of luck. You lose your case. But those that do put it in writing are more chance to win because it's in writing. It's a legal document in writing. We have a more sure word of prophecy whereunto ye do well to take heed to the Bible. Peter's telling you get to the Bible and do it. No Pope would tell you that. That's how you know Peter's not the Pope. The Pope locked up the Bible during the Dark Ages. Peter says get a Bible, read it, and do it. I'll give you free will. You do well. I'm not going to command you like God did. I'm going to say the best thing you can do is take heed to the Bible. You have free will to read the Bible. You can read it or you don't have to read it. That's your, I advise you, I advise you to read it. As unto light that shineth in a dark place, Jesus Christ, John chapter 3, John chapter 1. Unto the day dawn, rise in the sun. And the day star arise in your hearts. That's that first star that appears in the morning. That is the Lord Jesus Christ. Peter is talking about the second advent. You know how we know about the second advent? Because it's written. It's recorded. In the Bible. How do we know that the second advent is going to happen? Because everything that was recorded about the first advent already happened. Without the writing, we wouldn't know nothing about Jesus Christ. We would know nothing about God, except for terror, tales and fairy tales and stories around the campfire and all that, but men blow story. The telephone game. Play the telephone game. Get a group of people, start off, write down a, a sentence on a piece of paper, give it to the first person, and find out what you get to when you get to the last person. And God says, I know what man does, so I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll write it down. I'll put it in writing that you cannot get it wrong. And then again, <coughs> you got men today with perverted Bibles, modern Bibles, where they change it, even though it's written. Shame on them. Knowing this first, that no prophecy of Scripture is any private interpretation. I do not have the right to take this Bible and teach whatever I want to teach. It has to be lined with God, the Holy Spirit, and Jesus Christ. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needs not to be shamed, rightly defining the word of truth. If I don't do that, or if you don't do that, or if your preacher don't do that, or whoever don't do that, they are a liar. For prophecy came not in old time by the will of man. Man did not say, hey, let's get together and write a Bible. This Bible is written by men all over different ages, all over different occupations, all over different parts of the world. There is no way that David could have got with Moses and say, hey, let's write the Bible. Now, what I'm going to write, you're going to have to write to match what I wrote. And don't forget, we're going to get together with Solomon because he's going to write something. And then don't forget, we're going to have to get with Isaiah. We're going to make sure Isaiah matches what we... No, he can't. There's great difference of time. 
and with that vast of people and occupations and times and places shows that the Holy Spirit was involved in giving us the Bible. How did Moses write about the virgin birth? Isaiah write about the virgin birth. Matthew write the, about the virgin birth. Luke write about the virgin birth. A doctor, a shepherd, a prophet. Look all the years of that. Man is the pen and the Holy Spirit is the ink. By the will of man, but holy men of God spake, thought as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. David, that that poem you just thought about, write it. Well, I just write it. I'm going to use it later. Prophet, that thought you just had, put that down on paper. There's a place I think was it. I think it's Mark. It says, and as the prophet Jeremiah said, now they get all upset because when they run to Jeremiah, they can't find it. It said said, it didn't say write down. There are things in here that are not written down by man that the Holy Spirit said later on, write that, because that's what he said. Now how would they know? Because the Holy Spirit told them, because the Holy Spirit knows his people and knows the holy men. Now write this down. This is what that prophet said, but I can't find it in this book. That's okay. I know what he said. The author and finisher of this Bible is the Holy Spirit. The author and finisher of my salvation is Jesus Christ. The author and finisher of the creation is God. And these people don't understand that we got one sal salvation, one Jesus. One sacrifice. We have one Bible. Ordained and approved by God. Written by God. And with that, Peter said, we do well to take heed. Now, we got a problem when we got a man's Bible and we got a God's Bible. Well, which one are you going to listen to? Which one are you going to give heed to? Well, many give heed to the man's Bible. That's wrong. It's to be God's word that we are to get heed. And the third class of people is, well, it was just written by men. So were textbooks. And textbooks were written so that person writing that book will get money. Moolah. Go to a college and find out how much a textbook costs. And then you go to a dollar store and find out you can get a Bible for a dollar. A good one. And this Bible that I hold in my hands, the King James Bible, minus the notes, is not copyrighted. That I can copy the King James Bible and I can put it into bounding and I can put a cover on it and I can sell it and not be in charge in trouble with anybody for copyright infringement. In fact, God would want me to, to copy the Bible and get it out. So what's the will of man here? For a guy who writes a textbook, I want money. Ooh, give me money. <laughs> and then and, and in two years, I'm going to write another book. Just change it a little bit. So you got to get rid of that book and buy this book and I get more money. Ooh, the love of money. Where Where is God's? I want my people to know me. I want my people to know about me. I want my people to know what I expect from them. I want my people to know the right way. I want my people to know about my son. I want to know my people to know about the enemy. And you take that word and you get it out. There's a big difference. One does it for money and one does it for I want you to know. Isn't that what we learned? Isn't that what the early part of this chapter said? To know, to know, to know, to know. God wants us to know about him, and he put it down in writing. When you've got something very important to do in life, what do you say? Put it in writing. When they tell you memory, right? We talked about memory. 
When you want to remember, when you want to put in memory about something, put it in writing. Put it on a notepad. When you got a grocery list, you put it on paper. And that paper does you no good when you get to the grocery store and that paper is sitting on the kitchen counter. Does it? Well, your Bible doesn't do you no good clothes sitting on a coffee table when, you, when you're supposed to be reading it, does it? How can you remember the Bible when you don't open it and read it? How can you buy the stuff at the grocery store when you forgot the list? When you can't read the list? People forget to read the Bible. And then they forget about the Bible. That's why churches are a mess they are today. People don't know what the Bible says.